Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nilesh Samani, Medical Director at the British Heart Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all, especially those who've been with us before and those who are joining us for the first time to this live and ticking event, where we, where we gather together, usually on a monthly basis, to tell you about the latest things that are happening at the BHF and to discuss some of the research that we fund. Today's live and ticking event is particularly special because as some, I think some of you will know, this is the 60th anniversary of the BHF have been founded. And indeed today, the 28th of July is the day 60 years ago that the BHF was actually founded. So this is our true 60th birthday today. So at the BHF there's a lot of celebration going on and I'm delighted that we are able to share this birthday with you and for you to be able to join us. And we have a real treat for you today in, in, in the two speakers we have for our 60th birthday live and taking event. The topic of the uh, discussion this afternoon is going to be about cardiac surgery. Um, and therefore I wanted to kick off really by asking you a question and, 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 and we'll put this up in the, in the web and just to see your, uh, what, what understanding you have about where we were 60 years ago. So he, here's a question on the screen, um, you know, uh, asking you how many, uh, in the 1960s, approximately how many babies born with a severe heart defect made it to their first, first birthday? Have a guess or have a talk, answer this question and see whether you get it right. How many do you think survived until their first birthday? This is people with severe heart defects. Let's see what people. Well, you, you, I, I always knew that the BHF live and taking event is very, very well um, uh, informed. And, and people say 75% of you said two out of 10 is absolutely right. And look at the situation today, six years la later, that where with the same thing, you know, eight out of 10 of such babies now survive to adulthood and have a very meaningful life. So, really dramatic changes have happened during the last 60 years um, uh, in, in the way that these babies. Uh, they're able to survive and not only survive, but have a very healthy and good quality quality of life. And a lot of it, I'm proud to say, has, you know, that the BHF have played a significant part, not only from the speaker we are going to hear from today, but also other BHF funded research that has contributed to this turnaround in, in, in terms of surgical innovation uh, for patients with heart disease. So today, um, Without further ado, I want to make sure we spend most time with our speakers and then the questions you have. I'm, I'm delighted that we'll be joined, first of all, by BHF Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the British Bristol Heart Institute and the National Heart and Lung Institute in London, Professor Gianni Angelini, who has had a long and really remarkable surgical career operating, operating on and fixing hearts. And Gianni will tell you something about the BHF funded research that, is, that we've supported over the many, many uh, years before him. We are equally delighted to be joined by you know, somebody who's really unique, uh, an explorer and a BHF ambassador, Sir Ralph Fiennes, who has a unique story which he'll share with us later today. And then we hope to finish the session. We hope to spend at least you know, one third of the session in a question and answer session where you can ask Gianni or Ralph, Ranulf or myself about any questions you have. We've had some pre-invited questions that we'll also pick up uh, and, and hopefully we'll answer as many questions that you put to us today. So without further ado, I, I wanted to pass on first to Professor Gianni Angelini and ask Gianni to, to, to make his presentation. Over to you, Gianni. Thank you, Nilesh. And uh, um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to show uh, what we've done over the last 20 or 30 years in Bristol, thanks to the continued support of the British Heart Foundation. As you may have guessed from my name and probably now from my accent, I'm Italian. I was born in Tuscany in this old beautiful place called Siena, which is an old medieval town. As a matter of fact, when I was in my teens, I wanted to be an engineer. And in fact, my dream was nothing to do with medicine. I wanted to fly aeroplane and in particular Concord. So as I was doing my engineering degree, uh, it just happened and I had a small injury to my left eyes, which was 
promptly resolved and bandaged for a couple of days. But I suddenly realized I couldn't see anything from the right eyes. So to cut a long story short, it turned out that I got a congenital abnormality, which is called amblyopia. Not something I readily advertise with my patients, or not at least after the successful operation. So as you can appreciate, my career as an airline pilot was over even before I ever started. So what was the next option? In my country, your, any parents want you to be an engineer. And uh, well, if you have to go for the second best, why not to try to be a doctor since this usually doesn't require to be too clever. What I want to demonstrate to you this afternoon is that heart surgery is nothing but apply engineering. So going briefly to what I do every day for a living. Now, this is the coronary artery of a patient who died, not having surgery, just happened to die. And what you can see here, this is like a cut across the coronary. All of this is thickening, which is called ferrin or atherosclerosis. And all this left for the blood to run is just this small space, which is probably 40% of what it should have been originally. Now, this patient maybe was complaining of angina, and he could have gone and see a cardiologist who possibly would have done several tests, one of which involved injecting some dyes into the coronary of the heart. And in this case, as you can see, this is the right coronary. Suddenly, there is a complete blockage. The patient may be referred to me. And what I do is straightforward engineering or plumbing. I take a piece of tube, perhaps from the arm or from the leg or from an artery inside the chest, and I do a bypass graft. This is the same patient. Here was the blockage. And now you've got a beautiful bypass graft, which is, again, bringing lots of blood to that heart. And the problem is over. Now, going back a little bit, this is the last slide I'm going to show you about myself, is uh, um, my medical school. I did my medical school in uh, Siena, and this is the hospital where I train. It's now a beautiful museum, which I would advise you to visit if you happen to be in Siena. And this is what used to be the uh, post-operative ward. So imagine here you sitting as a patient, in a bed after your operation, looking at the ceiling. So my job, and the same for my medical student colleague, was uh, as the patient woke up, we had to convince them that actually they were still in the land of the living and they hadn't gone suddenly to heaven. After my medical school, I spent some time in London uh, where I learned English. And then I did most of my surgical training in Wales. Uh, I, I have a Welsh wife and my wife called this the promised land. And he was there as a young trainee, as you can see, I'm quite young, lots of black hair. Then I met somebody who influenced my future career very significantly. This is Professor Andrew Anderson. He was one of the very first professor of cardiology appointed by the British Health Foundation. And it was there that I started really my academic interest. I went to see Andrew Anderson and I said, sir, I would like to get involved in research. And he said, well, to start with, you can't be involved in research, you have to be committed. And I had to explain to you, since your Italian is not, English is not very good, what's the difference between being committed and being involved? Think of a plate of ham and eggs. The hen is involved, the pig is committed. And from there on, I have to say, I was fully committed. And from there on, the BHF supported me. Up to nowadays, I met another a uh, wonderful colleague, Professor Andrea Newby, who subsequently became also a, a, a professor of um, a British Heart Foundation professor of cardiovascular uh, science in Bristol. And together we wrote the first grant to the BHF, which paid for my salary. I was then supported by the BHF, a, a junior fellow, and then an intermediate fellow, 
And I was sent to do a period of training in Holland, all paid by the BHF. And at the end of 1992, I was appointed by the BHF to the chair of cardiac surgery in Bristol. So a complete support, as far as I can say, to my career from the British Heart Foundation. Now, coming back to heart surgery, when we do a heart operations, we have to fast attach the patient or the heart of the patient to a machine which is called the heart and the lung. And it's called so because it take over the work of the heart and the lung. And here you can see you've got a heart which is now being stopped, blood is taken out and then pumped back into the body after it's been reoxygenated by this machine. The problem in the 90s was twofold. One was that everything which had been studied was mostly based around adult. As you can see, there are pretty much big difference between the heart of an adult and the heart of a child, let alone the different pathology. The main feature was that everything was working around cold. In order to protect the body during the surgery, we would cool the body down, perhaps to as low as 28 degrees. Then we had to stop the heart. And again, we cool the heart down with a cold solution, again at four degrees centigrade. What I did when I arrived in Bristol with other colleagues was to investigate why we need to do, to take this decision of cooling everything. And I'm afraid you have to take my word for that. Over a period of 10 years, we came to the conclusion that in fact, maintaining the body and the heart at normal temperature was a much better affair. This is me in Bristol now as a professor of cardiac surgery from the BHF. And I can tell you that nowadays we even perform operation in newborn baby, as I said, at normal temperature. However, when I was in Bristol, I became interested also in something slightly more controversial. When we do the coronary operation, which I showed you earlier on, we work not inside the heart chambers, but on the surface of the heart. So my next uh, aim was, can we get rid of the heart and lung machine altogether when we do this coronary operation on the surface of the heart? And over the about 10 years, we start in the middle 90s, we develop what is now known as the Bristol technique, which is the technique of doing the operation with the heart beating all the time. I'm going to show you some short shot now on, uh, uh, on some surgical procedure. Uh, nobody's ever fainted, but if you are a little bit weak of constitution, perhaps you may turn, turn aside. So th the first things which we do when we do one of uh, such operation is we cut the breastbone in the middle, and then we have to lift the heart and we use a little trick with a swab at the back of the heart because Originally, the heart will be, the tip of the heart will be sitting down here. But to have access to the heart, we have to sort of dislodge it towards, uh, towards uh, the middle. The next step is how we go into work on a heart which is jumping around and doing the stitching. And here then the engineering come through again. This, as you can see, is nothing more or less than the foot of a sewing machine. As a matter of fact, I got this idea uh, watching my aunt who was a sea mistress uh, shortening a pair of my trousers. So this little device will allow to keep these things still as the rest of the heart move and as the lungs which I hear keep moving. Because as I said, we don't have a machine which is taking over the work of the heart and the lungs. The next question is how you're going to do the stitching. This is a coronary artery which has just been open. I'm temporarily occluding with a pair of forceps the blood flow. And here is another little engineering device, a silicone tube with a hole in the middle, which is inserted into the coronary. Once this is done, there is blood going to the heart and I can do the stitching without any rush and without any damage to the heart. As the operation is completed, I have to remove this little string here, 
because of course we don't want to leave the little tube inside. But as you can see, the most astonishing things is that this heart is now being rotated 180 degree completely. This heart is still pumping and maintaining the function of the, of, of the heart of pumping blood all around the bodies. Once we had this sorted out more or less in terms of surgical technique, of course, you always got people criticizing you and say, well, you, you know, but what? You're trying to make something simple, incredibly complicated. And since we are an academic department, we went to demonstrate or trying to demonstrate if there were any benefit by using this technique. And we did what is called a randomized study, which is like you toss a coin and you allocate patients either to the conventional technique of the operation with the pump or on a beating heart. This study was published in 2002 and together with other work from us and other people around the world, we provided evidence then avoiding the use of the cardiopulmonary bypass, doing the operation on the beating heart had beneficial effects in terms of protecting the heart, the kidney and the brain, and also resulting in less blood loss, less requirement for transfusion, less infection, and also a significant saving in about 20 to 25% in cost of the whole surgical procedure. And this is what happened then in Bristol. In 1996, all the operations were done, you can see the blue line with the machine, hardly any was done on the beating heart. As we go better at it, progressively the number of per operation performed on the beating heart increased. And nowadays the technique is adopted uh, around the world uh, on an average for about 20, 25% of operation performed worldwide. You'll have country where is university use, like for example, in India, uh, due to the significant saving in cost, but also is almost 100% using very high technology and very high surgical standard like in Japan. In other country is used perhaps 20, 30%, in some other a lot less and so forth. But this is a surgical technique, which as you can appreciate, evolve and uh, uh, require to a certain extent, uh, some different form of training and hence time to be implemented. Now I'm the guy who goes around now telling the story, but as you can appreciate, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for a heck of a lot of people involved in this process. In the Bristol Heart Institute, we got really a multi speciality team. We got engineers, we got clinicians, we got basic scientists, we got statisticians, we got epidemiologists, without of whom none of this would have actually happened. And perhaps most important, without whom and without the support of the British Heart Foundation, none of these would have been possible at all. On our part, we're trying to give a little bit back to the British Air Foundation, not only me giving a nice talk to you today, but uh, uh, trying to be even more helpful. And this is one of our young heroes. This is Callum. This boy, who is now sitting here with me, was born with a severe congenital abnormality. Somebody for him, for which 20 years ago he would have never survived. He's now already undergone regretfully for him, four operation because it's been a process of reconstruction more or less of his heart, but now he's leading a reasonably normal life. And here is finding the time with me to advertise some secondhand furniture on behalf of the British Heart Foundation. So in short, I got a personal uh, debt of gratitude to the BHF for having taken me or having trusted me, if you like, from when I was an humble uh, registrar speaking a very poor English to uh, giving me a chair many years ago now in Bristol, which has allowed to develop an institute which, thanks to the BHF, is one of the best known not only in the United Kingdom but worldwide. From my part, not only I wish to thank the BHF, but also the supporters of the BHF, who I'm sure many of you are here today who are raising funds in all sorts of way and fashion. 
And without your support, we would not have achieved what we have achieved. From my part, all I can tell you is we will make a very good use of your money. You will have value for money. And I can also tell you that the best is really yet to come. Thank you for listening to me. Three minutes. Gianni. About the 2.3. 2.3, thanks. Yeah. Gianni, hi. Th th thank you very much for really a very uh, nice and beautiful presentation about your journey in improving cardiac surgery in, in Bristol. Uh, and and as, you, as you demonstrated very elegantly, the, the, the impact of this is not only about people in Bristol, but even uh, not only for people in the UK, but around the world. What you what you achieved, or and the evidence you produced about what, how this sort of technique might improve outcomes, has impact on 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 on, uh, on practice all around the world. And and the BHF are very proud of the work you've done, and uh, and also um, very pleased to have funded you over all these years. Uh, you, you've seen the post before. I bring on to our next and uh, guest on on, on uh, to to tell us about their own personal story that. Over the, because we're 60 years old now, we've taken the opportunity this year to just reflect back on um, some of the achievements of BHF-funded research over this period. And we've created, I just, it was a really difficult selection process, but uh, we've, we've we created 60 stories around the impact of BHF-funded research in different areas, not only in cardiac surgery, congenital heart disease surgery, but also in other areas of cardiovascular medicine, ranging from stroke, right onto heart attacks, to heart failure, to inherited heart diseases. And so we put them on our website and, and in the chat function, you'll see a, a link to that. So please take your time when you have that to go and read about some of the uh, stories which have been inspired by the support that you provided to us over all these years. So it's my pleasure now, of course, to welcome our second speaker uh, for this, somebody who probably does not need a lot of introduction. He's world renowned and is an explorer an inventor and and Sir Ramu Fiennes, Fiennes, who is who's going to be our speaker and give a personal perspective on, on his journey through in, in, in heart disease. Ramu. Thank you very much indeed. And happy birthday to BHF. Um, yeah, I didn't smoke for 40 years and kept reasonably fit, um, basically in the army. And then um, my wife and I, my late wife of 36 years, we decided we would go into the world of expeditions by breaking existing world records. So if a particular mountain hadn't been climbed, that's a record to break. You must be first, particularly if you're beating the Norwegians. We don't call them rivals, we call them enemy in order to try harder. So that's what I was doing. And around about 19, no, 2003, I was going to um, go to Edinburgh from Bristol Airport uh, to give a lecture, which is how I make a living. Nobody pays you for actually organizing expeditions. And I was reading a magazine on the flight and apparently I collapsed. And the pilot didn't take off from Bristol got the fire engine to come back, two first responders uh, with a defibrillator came rushing across and literally within minutes of my collapsing and having a doctor who was one of the passengers doing first aid and pumping, within a few minutes, uh, I was on the defibrillator. They found it was um, very serious. I won't go into all the medical terminology, but um, uh, Gianni will remember. And they rushed me um, having more defibrillator attention in the ambulance on the way to the Bristol Royal Infirmary. And uh, the uh, person who was put in charge was, thank God, Gianni Angelini. And he basically decided that um, the best thing to do would be to um, take away the two um, arteries which had stopped working or been blotted up uh, quickly and uh, to replace them with two sort of mock arteries, one of which was the mammary gland, which obviously in men doesn't usually get worked, and a long vein like a bit of spaghetti, I think, from my lower leg. 
I don't know quite what it would normally do before Gianni took it away, but um, it's gone. And these two double bypasses, and around about three days and nights later, I do remember waking up, my wife, my late wife now, was sitting there, and she said, three days and nights ago, you were on an airplane, and you had a massive heart attack, and you've had a double bypass since then. I remembered nothing of this whatsoever. Anyway, I got phoned up by Dr. Michael Stroud, the senior lecturer in nutrition at Southampton University today, and um, an amazing guy. He's, in my opinion, Britain's number one uh, stress nutritionist, working out about starvation and what happens to your body when you're starving and having to work hard, like hauling big manholes in order to do the first manhole crossing unsupported of the Antarctic continent and that sort of record. So um, yeah, I rang him up or he rang me up and said, look, you and I are planning to do um, a record breaking seven marathons in only three and a half months time. And now you've gone and had a heart attack. It would involve the first ever seven by seven by seven. You run a marathon in seven continents and seven consecutive days with 18 hours of jet lag in between each flight and having to use scheduled flights, obviously British Airways provided them. And therefore you had to very, very carefully make sure you didn't take more than five hours on any of the marathons because you would miss your next scheduled flight and fail. And we knew that the dreadful one would be humid, which would be Singapore, and that the next most dreadful one would be probably uh, Africa, which we would have to do by night from the pyramids and then rush to an aeroplane to North America to get the one in a few hours later. So it was um, not a good thing for somebody who had just had a heart condition and double bypass. But I wanted to do it and I felt better after a couple of weeks and um, my wife realized that I was beginning to get that look of wanting to break another record. And she knew all about Mike Stroud's plan for seven by seven by seven. So she took me with her to Gianni and said in front of uh, me, Gianni, what do you think of my husband running a marathon? Only four months or less after the double bypass. Now, Gianni had still got at that time the 800 meter record for Italy. So he was a very, very fit man. He looked at my late wife and he said, Ginny, um, I would love to give you a straightforward answer, but um, I've done this operation to your husband on many, many people previously, and neither they nor their partner has said, can I, Gianni, say it's okay for the patient to run a marathon? Didn't mention seven marathons. And Gianni then looked at Ginny and said, therefore, I'm in no position to really comment on that, but I must say, do not let him run more than 130 beats per minute competitively. That's the secret. So it happened and we ran them. And then a little bit after that, my wife uh, died and I become, became miserable, couldn't do a damn thing and uh, became negative. And so I thought, I've got to stamp this out. I've got to somehow become active again. And what I would do is to try and beat my lifelong vertigo phobia. Because, um, yeah, and I thought, if you want to get rid of vertigo, surely you climb Everest. Well, I had been invited by um, my black friend, Sibu Sisu, the first black man up Everest from the easy side, that's um, uh, Nepal. And he wanted to be the first up the difficult side, the Tibet side. And he had asked me a year before, and I'd said, no, Sibu, I'd love to be with you on it, but I get vertigo. So after this change of mind because of Ginny's death, he said, yeah, it's not too late. Um, we're doing it next year. So next year, we go out to um, Tibet and the base camp from Everest. 
And to cut a long story short, after two and a half months training, going up and down, up and down, ever higher, we got to the very last night at 28 and a half thousand feet above sea level. Um, and then 300 meters in height from the summit, I had uh, an angina attack, um, called it a heart attack, an angina attack, on a bit of solid ice in the middle of the night with one Sherpa. And I realized um, that I must take what um, Gianni had made me take, which was glycerine trinitrate pills. But if you are got big thick, it's minus 40, it's dark. You're on the last little bit before the summit ridge. And I couldn't find the pills in their bottle somewhere in 16 pockets, tied up with climbing harnesses and ropes. And, uh, you know, you take your hand, your glove off, it gets very cold very quickly. So I panicked. Eventually, luckily, did uh, find the pills and naturally took them. And three days later, the Sherpas somehow got me back alive to the base camp. And the doctor said, um, can I see your pills? So I gave him the bottle. He said, no, not the bottle, the pills. And I said, well, I obviously took the pills. He said, yeah, how many? And I, I said, well, whatever the number was in the bottle. I was in a panic. And it turned out that you're not meant to have more than 60 in that bottle. And I um, took 60 and you're not meant to have more than two. So I think that's the Guinness Book of Records. Anyway, about... Um, a year later, we had raised 500,000 pounds for the British Heart Foundation. And so I thought, well, as it's so easy to raise money from older people by doing something which um, is rather odd if you had a heart attack, um, we'll do it again. This time I'll get to the top. So trying from the easy side, uh, Nepal, I got again to over 28 and a half thousand feet but unfortunately watched uh, a friend of mine being buried up there and then two more people being buried and I wimped out. That was in 2004. So again, 2005, by which time we'd made over a million pounds for the British Heart Foundation, we tried again, this time with one wonderful Sherpa and nobody else. And it was dead easy, got to the top, no problem. I was by then 65, so I was the first OAP to get to the top. The Daily Express, all they said was, well, it was easy for him because he had a bus pass. Ha ha. Anyway, we raised a total of 2.3 million, uh, which we handed over to the British Heart Foundation. So it was well worth having a heart attack in the first place. I had also en route to climb the north face of the Eiger, uh, the oldest Brit to do that at that time. And uh, I was terrified, but I didn't actually lose my sense of vertigo, even though getting to the top of the north face of the Eiger and, of course, Everest. But it did test out, like the seven marathons tested out my heart, the height and the fear tested out my heart. Those are three things which can give you heart attacks. And I can still think of Gianni by feeling up under my chin where the um, top of the neck and uh, top of your chest, as you know, you saw Gianni's pictures of opening up. Well, once he's opened it up, he's got to tie it all together again. And what he did that with me, tied it up with wire, and I can still feel the knots at the top where he tied a reef knot, I suppose. You can still feel that. It'll be there for the rest of your life. 18 years ago, he did that, and I still feel touch wood strong and I really never, ever will forget my total gratitude and, um, in, well, my impression, I'm so impressed by what Gianni does and still is doing uh, 18 years later. And I thank him for my life. Thank you, Gianni. Thank you, everybody at the British Heart Foundation and in his department at the BRI. Big thank you. So run a brilliant presentation, brilliant talk, brilliant personal, uh, uh, sharing your personal history with us. Thank you so much. And thank you really for your support for the British Heart Foundation, for, for Gianni's work. Um, it's really difficult to top that, really. This really made our 60th birthday very special to hear you speak about your, your journeys, particularly up, up, up Everest. But the thing that I wanted to come back to is what you said right at the beginning when you were on the, on, on the plane in Bristol. 
because the other thing that the BHF have done, you mentioned the defibrillator and and, and what you must have had, which is a cardiac arrest on the on the plane, which is often what often the first presentation of a heart attack, is that of course the the rapidity with which people can attend to you at that moment is critical. You know, we saw that recently with the football, with, with, with Ericsson, and you know, it's, it's so important. The BHF has invested such a lot of effort to make sure that we have a nation of lifesavers. So we, you know, we were talking about it this morning that you know, more than 7 million people have been trained through BHF-related activity to, to do CPR and to be able to use defibrillators and to, and to save lives. So you know your, your story right at the beginning of your your medical history is also remarkable. The BHF had a touch point there. Never mind Gianni's brilliant surgery, but we obviously wanted to make sure that people are protected when they have a heart attack and the heart rhythm changes. So thank you very much for for sharing your your, your personal experience with us. Thank if you, you um, Nilesh. Yeah. I have to say that at the time um, when I got home. Why did Ran get a heart attack? He doesn't drink. He takes exercise. He's very fit. And then one of the medical staff came up. Yeah, he said they were flying um, on EasyJet. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Well, I think that's, you know, I mean, I, we could talk about this forever because you're right. I see, and I'm sure Gianni sees a lot of patients just like you who led a great life, you know, don't have high blood pressure, don't necessarily have diabetes. You know, you say you haven't been had a smoke for 40 years. Um, and yet people develop heart disease. It's not only about lifestyle. We know a lot about it. There's a lot of genetics involved in, in this and particularly for heart attacks. And one of the things that BHF funded also is, of course, understanding or unraveling the genetic basis of so many forms of heart diseases. And that opens up new opportunities for developing new treatments, preventative treatments and identifying people at risk. So you are right that we don't fully understand. The, the work of the BHF now is just as important as it was 60 years ago because for many of the diseases, we still don't have a really complete understanding to prevent them. And you know, we still have another 60 years to go and perhaps more to try and really make those advances. So it's really, you know, I, I think you, you're, you're again, your story about developing heart disease without necessarily the risk factors is, 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 is what we see in daily practice as well. It's not only people who smoke and have a, unhealthy lifestyle to develop this. So may, many different facets you touch about what the BHF does in terms of your, your, of your story. But let's take some questions now, if that's, that's, that, that's okay to, to the two of you. And I've got my colleague, Christy Norris, who is going to be, be um, leading the question and answer session. So Christy. Great, thank you, Nilesh. Just a comment that we've had some really lovely messages from everybody that's joined us today. So thank you for your talks. So the first question uh, is for you, Gianni, um, and it is, what do you think the next big innovative leap will be in heart surgery in the future? A big question to start with. Well, that, that is a difficult one, but uh, I would say probably in the area of pediatric heart surgery, and I could give you an example of something which we are developing in Bristol. Um, in fact, by one of my colleagues who happened to be another Italian trained by me, Professor Caputo, who has been appointed the first ever British Heart Foundation Professor of Heart Surgery in, uh, in, um, in Pediatric Heart Surgery. The, the idea is to, when we operate on children and they got very serious abnormality, really, we don't fix the problem fully. For example, some children are born with an artery from their heart missed. So we use a man-made conduit, but of course the conduit degenerates, the child grows, the conduit doesn't grow. The little boy I showed you earlier on, on the sati with me, he's already had four operations and he's probably need another one before he reached the age of 20. So the idea is to really bioengineer those conduits, possibly using the tissues from the child, from the placenta, from the umbilical cord when the child is born, in such a way that then we can use that surgery, tissues which is from the child itself or herself, uh, with the hope that these tissues will then grow and in doing so will avoid a lot more operation and as you can imagine benefit from for the child as well as the health service in general. I think that is probably where the next big development will take place in pediatric heart surgery. Great, thank you Gianni. Um, our next question Gianni is also for you um, and it's about your career. So when you look back at your BHF funded career to date, 
What are you most proud of? Well, that's a difficult one too. As I said, the BHF supported me from when I was a first year trainee. So I'm eternally grateful and I hope I've been able to give a little bit, a little bit back. Probably the most proud things I feel is uh, I got the position in Bristol in 90, end of 1992. There was no academic department. I like to believe that, uh, if you like, I was the inspiration behind creating what the Bristol Heart Institute is now. Of course, all the other people who have contributed, you, you can't do things on your own. But perhaps I was the one who was the motivator, if you like, the, the, the facilitators. And the other things which I feel very proud is, there are two other British Heart Foundation professor of heart surgery in the whole country, three with me, I'm towards the end of my career. The other two are not because they are much younger than me and uh, I'm very proud to have trained them. And one is now the professor of cardiology, BHF professor of cardiology in Leicester, uh, Gavin Murphy, a, a brilliant scientist and surgeon, and the other is Professor Caputo, as I said, who is the first ever British Health Foundation Professor of Pediatric Heart Surgery. So I think this is probably the things I'm most proud of. Great, thank you. Our next question is for, is for you, Ranal, um, and it's a similar sort of question. When you look at all you have achieved since your surgery, thanks to the lifeline that Professor Gianni gave you, what are you most proud of? I think um, in my life, not nothing to do with the heart, um, of um, being, you know, such happy marriages um, and sharing with somebody, your wife, um, long, long years of happiness together, which is, I think, in many cases, the stopping of ongoing stress, which has to do with heart problems. So although it's not a medical comment, it's a comment that I think has to do with the outcome of um, heart status. But in terms of the uh, records that we have broken, I think probably it would be the first and only journey around planet Earth vertically Columbus uh, people have been run horizontally. Many, many people have. Nobody had, when uh, my late wife Jenny suggested that we do it in 1972, she came up with her plan. We worked solidly getting sponsors, etc., cetera, till 1979. And with no money at all, we managed to get a three-year expedition from Greenwich we set out. We followed the zero meridian round over Antarctica, crossed Antarctica up the other side, over the Arctic Ocean and the North Pole, through the Northwest Passage before that, and back without flying one meter of the 52,000 mile journey. Uh, nobody has ever done it again since. And um, we were very proud of that. And we, altogether by the end of the expeditions, we had raised a total for UK charities, including the BHF, of 18.9 million pounds. And uh, we did everything with wonderful sponsors and wonderful uh, financial givers. And that would remain, I think, the one which all our members of the expedition uh, are to this day very proud of. Amazing story. Thank you very much, Ranalf. Our next question is for Nilesh, uh, which is, from the BHS point of view, what sort of surgical research grants would you love to see come through in applications? Chrissy, I think we've, we've, we've seen a, a great exposition of the type of research we want to fund. You know, Gian has given a really nice uh, demonstration of, of the sort of impactful research which benefits patients that we want to fund. You know, and so, some of this research, as he's also demonstrated, takes a long time to achieve its goal. You know, he's perfected the surgical technique, and then you, you have to build up the evidence base so that other people can use that technique. And he, he showed that in his, in his talk very well. I think to, so the so, so simple answer to the question, of course, is, is research that we can see has the potential of benefiting 
patients at the end of the day. And to, and to f facilitate that, um, one of the things we've done recently is to set up a thing called the Clinical Research uh, Collaborative, which is that we brought an infrastructure together where people like Gianni and surgeons and working with other types of re researchers and patients as well, try to prioritize the important questions. So what we want to see at the BHF is applications to us coming in to fund research, where we know that it has the buy-in of the research community as a whole. We say this is the most important question we want, or the most important question we want to answer. And that has the support of patients and the public. So they've taken them along on the journey. So we set up the clinical research collaborative with that in mind. And we expect over the next few years for the type of applications we get to reflect that in terms of the impact on patients. So, so really, you know, the answer to the question is, of course, around patient benefit. Perfect. Thank you, Nilesh. And Ranulf, the next question is for yourself. Um, from the perspective of a heart surgery patient, what do you feel is important to consider when scientists develop different surgical techniques? I don't think that's a question that I can deal with. Um, I'm perfectly happy if the operation succeeds and en enables the patient to carry on doing what she or he really, really want to do. And uh, right up to three years ago, when I was about 74 years old, um, I was entered for a different charity um, into the Marathon des Sables, which is the hottest marathon of all, and is 245 miles in, in the Sahara, and really not good for your heart. And Gianni once again won out. And so I, that's my answer get to an expert like Gianni, who's gonna enable you to carry on doing what you wanted to do before without your ticker letting you down. Great, thank you, Manuel. Our next question um, is for Gianni, and it's actually from one of your patients, Gianni, who, who's with us today, Michael Western. And he says, I was fortunate enough to have a beating heart single bypass by Professor Angelini using the mammary artery. What does the mammary artery have um, in terms of better long-term benefits compared to other arteries. Two years on and I feel I am in perfect health. Lovely comment and question. Uh, <clears throat> we don't really know why and how, but this mammary artery, which there are two actually, which run behind your breastbone on either side, um, it just happened to be there, which is very convenient because you can actually just um, free it and attach it to, to, to one of the coronary of the heart. Probably is um, being an artery and some of the property of these artery are uh, really the key to its success. Because contrary to, for example, the vein from the leg, then in some patient, they will start degenerating after sort of 15 years or so. Uh, the mammary never does. So as long as the surgeon does the correct operation, that bypass will never stop working. So it's almost like a gift for God sitting there. It's not of any much use for anything because in fact, when we use it for heart surgery, you would think, but if we cut it and use it for heart surgery, are we going to damage something? There is no evidence of any damage or anything but um, it's the best things which can be used and it will last forever. Christy, can I, can I just add to what Giannis just said? Um, there's also, I mean, just to, to demonstrate the sort of research we fund, because Giannis is quite right that the veins that, you know, Ranul says a, a big piece of vein was taken from his leg when he had his bypass surgery because he used one artery and one vein. The vein has this tendency to, 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 to become blocked over time. And some of the sort of research we are funding, particularly the University of Edinburgh, is to understand to, to prevent these veins becoming blocked over the time. So, you know, there's, there's some evidence that this is related to the stress that the vein feels because suddenly veins don't have high pressure, they're not attached to high pressure, and the high pressure in the arterial system causes the veins to behave in a particular way. And we are trying to so be funding very advanced research now, which is very near patient testing to show if we can protect the veins from getting blocked over time. So that might make it even better. So that's, a, you know, it just shows the sort of breadth of BHF research. I mean, what Gianni demonstrated was the 
use of arterial grafts and the off-pump surgery, but also there's an important worldwide problem because veins still get used everywhere because you don't have enough internal memory arteries to do all the bypasses sometimes. So we do need to find novel ways of protecting the veins as well. In fact, if I may add something, yeah. best grant I ever got as a young trainee in Bristol together with Professor Newby was on how to improve surgical technique to reduce the damage when taking the vein out of the leg and putting it as a bypass graft. And this was 1984. And at that time, it was a serious problem, which now I wouldn't say is resolved, but it's certainly the, the longevity of this vein now is much, much greater than it was in the past. Thank you, Gianni. Thank you, Nilesh. Um, so we have another question. Gianni, it would be great if, if you could answer this one. Do you see robotics or AI in heart surgery today? There is some use of robotic in heart surgery, but it's quite limited. Um, a robotic surgery has got some fantastic application, like for example, in urology. Uh, if you want to remove somebody's prostate, it's really a must nowadays. In heart surgery, is not so much used, not least because in heart surgery, there is a lot more blood around. And sometimes the robot tend to get um, blind by the blood. Uh, also, a lot of the things which you can do robotically can be done actually uh, uh, without a robot. Uh, if I'm allowed a few seconds to give you a very simple analogy, uh, one of my obsessions is always being aeroplane. And um, since I couldn't fly any because of the reason I told you, but I was very fortunate when I arrived in Bristol, to, which is one of the places where Concord was developed. So I ended up operating on one of the test pilots. And of course, uh, as a gift, I wanted to go and see what they have done. So they took me to their uh, called Big Shed, where, where they were doing all the, obviously at that time, the, the, the planning and so forth. And on the wall, there was uh, a writing which for me, it was very, very thoughtful. And the writing would say, what does not go into an aircraft cannot go wrong. And that's the kind of attitude I have used really in my surgery is keep it simple. Don't complicate it. Thank you, Gianni. Um, one more question for, for yourself, uh, Gianni. What percentage of blockage would you consider for a bypass? And that's a, a live question we've had from Zena. Thank you, Zena. Um, usually it's anything which has to be at least more than 60%. Nowadays, there are very sophisticated technique from our colleagues, the cardiologists, and they can measure what is called flow effectively they can give you a much more accurate indication of the narrowing rather than simply looking at some picture which may show you a narrowing. So, but yes, we, we wouldn't contemplate uh, operating on anything less than 60%. And of course, the surgery is not only based on uh, what is the narrowing, but what are the symptoms, uh, what are the type of narrowing and which part of the coronaries are involved and how many because sometimes you can treat uh, the, the pathology with alternative method, like I'm sure you've heard about angioplasty and stenting. And in some other cases, medical treatment is as good as any intervention. Thank you, Gianni. And our last question before handing back to, to Nilesh to close, this is a question for, for Sir Ranulf. Um, apart from raising a phenomenal amount of heart research funds, uh, what is your next big challenge? I really don't want to be rude at all, Christy, in not answering your question, but we have a problem because we aren't the only people who go for big polar records. The Norwegians do it too. We constantly listen to what they're planning. They listen to what we are planning and then they go for it. So um, 
Watch As this I don't space. know, you may have some Norwegians listening to us now, <laughs> so forgive me if I don't talk about our future plans. No, that's but, fine. We'll, we'll watch you closely, Ranalf. We'll see yeah. what's next. <laughs> Whatever they do, I am sure that I will keep going as long as my Gianni ticker keeps going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ranalf. Great. I'll hand over to you, Nelesh, to close. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, Thank you. Uh, just one. I, I thought we'd put a one last poll question, Chris, if you don't mind, before before we close the event. Um, and this is really about whether people have enjoyed this afternoon and and felt the and the better understanding of what the BHF is here for in terms of funding research. So perhaps you can just answer this question for my colleagues. Okay. That's your answer we come up with. Great. Um, that's lovely to see. And, and thank you very much for that response. I mean, this is what the li live and taking events are all about. And, and it's good to see that, that you clearly uh, had more understanding of what the BHF is here for. So let me end today by thank you for all of you for joining us today. Um, I, I see from what's been put in the chat questions that you uh, hope you enjoy learning about our, our hearing our brilliant speakers and how your support helps us to fund the most impactful science possible. We look forward, of course, as I said earlier, to funding even more outstanding science with your support for, for the next 60 years. A reminder that this event has been recorded and will be available on our website if you want to look at it from next week. Um, I apologize if you didn't have time to answer your questions today. I know there were quite a few posted and sent in advance. Uh, please visit, if you want to, our Heart Helpline webpage, where we'll put up a link in a moment where we can perhaps take the question offline. We encourage you to give us your feedback and suggestions by completing the, the survey that we'll be sending you by email, which will help really shape future events of, of, of this type and what, what, would really, what you really want to hear from us. Um, as I said to you at the beginning, this is part of a series of events, live and ticking events that we are running to celebrate our 60th uh, anniversary. And the next event will be on Wednesday, the 25th of August, at the same time between 4 and 5 p.m., when we'll be joined by uh, one of our other BHF professors, Professor Sir Rory Collins from the University of Oxford. Uh, those of you who don't know about Professor Collins' work, he's been fairly instrumental in terms of developing the evidence or the most commonly prescribed drug in, in the world, you know, just statins. So you'll hear about the journey, about how these drugs have, have helped to help prevent heart disease. So please, please tell your friends and family and share your, your, your share this through the networks if other people want to join. And if you haven't signed up to our, to our website, the link will be posted in the chat box now. So again, it really leaves me to just thank uh, Sir Ranulf and Jenny for their outstanding presentations today. I certainly enjoyed listening to them and it's made the 60th birthday particularly special. So thank you both for your, for your great presentations and thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope you have a good, uh, good day, a good rest of the day. Thank you everybody. <laughs>